program provides step-by-step -step instruction on how to properly assemble, set up, and adjust an MF540, MF550, MF750, or MF760 combine upon its arrival from the factory. Regardless of whether this is your first attempt at preparing a combine for delivery to the customer, or you've been doing it for years, this tape can help you. Detailed instructions given are designed to help eliminate setup and pre-delivery errors that lead to poor combine performance, repeated service trips, and unhappy customers. And they also help make your job easier by putting the setup procedures in their proper order. There's no going back to correct jobs that were done out of sequence. And there's less wasted time due to duplication of effort as you move from one procedure to the next. Let us show you exactly what we mean. To begin with, there are a number of inspections that must be performed prior to starting the combine's engine and unloading it from the rail car or truck. These inspections are especially important since any piece of equipment is subject to vandalism and other hazards during shipment. So even though all MF combines are driven at the factory, don't overlook even a minor detail or assume that the combine is still in running order. The first step in the inspection process is to check the combine and its accessories for dents, scrapes, and other types of damage that could have occurred during shipment. Now is the time to bring this type of problem to the shipper's attention, not after the combine has been unloaded. Once you're satisfied that no shipping damage has occurred, you're ready to inspect the engine accessories, oil levels, and traction drives. Never start the combine's engine or attempt to drive the combine until all of the following checks are completed and any necessary adjustments have been made. First, check the radiator coolant level to make sure it is no less than one inch below the neck on the radiator. This is also a convenient time to test the antifreeze. It must measure at least 34 degrees below zero Fahrenheit before the combine is delivered to the customer. Move on to the battery and look it over carefully for any signs of damage. Then, check to make sure the cables are tight. The air cleaner is another critical component to check before starting the engine. Water may have gotten into the filter housing or dust bowl during shipment. And of course, dust is always a problem too. While you're inspecting the air cleaner, also make sure the hose clamps on the intake pipe are in place and tight. Begin your check of the combine's oil levels at the hydraulic reservoir. And remember, if you're working on an MF-550 with hydrostatic drive, there are two hydraulic reservoirs to inspect. Move on to the brake reservoir, transmission fluid level, final drive gearbox oil. And if you're setting up an MF-550, 750, or 760, the level of the fluid in the cylinder drive. In the engine compartment, Check the engine oil level and the radiator fan and alternator belts for tension. Measure the tension of these two belts by using your thumb to apply approximately 25 pounds of pressure midway between their pulleys and noting the deflection. If the deflection exceeds three quarters of an inch, adjust the tension until it is correct. The limit of travel of the traction drive belts should also be inspected and adjusted at this time. But first, you will need to start the engine, which requires some special procedures. If the engine is turbocharged, pull the stop control into the up position and crank the engine for approximately 10 seconds. This will lubricate the turbocharger. Once this has been done, or if the engine isn't turbocharged, proceed by putting the transmission in neutral and placing the engine fuel stop control in the down position. Now, push the left foot pedal down to engage the ignition switch and crank the engine. When the engine starts, observe the oil pressure gauge, temperature gauge, amp meter, and fuel gauge to make sure they activate properly. Hold the ground speed control lever back until the variator assembly moves into the low speed position. The head of the adjusting bolt should now be in contact with the block on the support assembly and the upper drive belt should be an eighth inch below or flush with the outer rim of the outside pulley on the variator. If the belt is out of position, loosen the upper lock nut and turn the adjusting bolt 
to a position where the belt will be an eighth inch from the outer rim when the bolt makes contact with the support block. Retighten the lock nut, restart the engine, and repeat the check to make sure the bolt head and belt are in the correct position. If they're not, repeat the process until the correct position is maintained. If a low speed adjustment is made, then it is mandatory the high speed belt also be adjusted. With the engine running, hold the ground speed lever forward until the variator moves into the high speed position. In this instance, the high speed stop should contact the block of the support assembly and the lower drive belt should be an eighth inch below or flush with the outer rim of the inside pulley. If either are out of position, loosen the lock nut and adjust the high speed stop as necessary. Retighten the lock nut, restart the engine, and go through the procedure a second time or until the correct position of the high speed stop and lower drive belt are maintained. This concludes the inspection and adjustment of the dry belts. To prevent damage to the combine and its accessories when unloading from a rail car or truck, it is important that certain procedures be followed. First, make sure that all hold downs have been removed and that all obstructions have been moved out of the way. Next, check all drive controls to make sure they move freely. If you encounter a problem, find and correct it before attempting to move the combine. Then, start the engine and inspect the belt or hydrostatic traction drive by cycling them to fast, then back to slow and checking their operating performance. If they fail to function properly, adjust their linkage before moving the combine. Once these steps have been taken, carefully drive the combine off the truck or flat car. Now you're ready to install the platform extension and ladder. These two components must be attached to all MF combine models. Begin the job by positioning the platform extension in the combine frame. Then secure the platform at the front skirt with two quarter inch by five eighths inch hex bolts. Complete the installation of the platform extension by installing three three eighths inch by seven eighths inch hex bolts inside the front extension as we're doing here. Make sure all nuts are completely tightened. With the platform now in place, attach the ladder to the platform extension at the hinge pins. The ladder should slide into place easily and rotate freely around the hinge pins. Secure the ladder with a flat washer and hairpin. When the ladder has been secured, it's time to install the handrail on the platform extension. Position the rail at the forward bracket provided and secure with 3 8 inch by 7 8 inch hex bolts. Before tightening the bolts, position the rail at the rear bracket and install two 3 8 inch by 7 8 inch carriage bolts. Once all the bolts are in place, make sure all nuts have been completely tightened before proceeding to the next step. Next, locate the ladder handrail. Do not attempt to install this component until you've attached the V-block to the curved end of the ladder. A roll pin is provided to hold the block securely in place. Attach the ladder handrail to the upper bracket provided using one 3 8 inch by 7 8 inch carriage bolt. Before you tighten the nut, position the rail over the lower bracket and secure it with two 3 8 inch by 7 8 inch carriage bolts. Complete the job by tightening all nuts. Continue the installation of the ladder by attaching the latch assembly to the underside of the extension floor. To do this, place the strap provided between the latch assembly and the extension floor. Then secure both the latch and strap with 3 8 inch by 1 inch carriage bolts. Make sure the heads of the bolts are on the extension floor and not on the latch assembly. Now release the lock nut on the assembly and turn the inner nut to release the tension on the spring. This must be done before the assembly can be attached to the ladder. When the spring tension has been removed, attach the yoke to the bracket provided on the ladder with a half inch by three quarter inch clevis pin and secure with a hairpin. Next, 
Place the yoked collar on the opposite end of the spring into slotted bracket as shown here. With the ladder lowered, tighten the nuts on the rod to compress the spring. Turn the rod until a measurement of five and a quarter inches is reached between the underside of the hex head and the front side of the pins on the yoked collar. Correct spring tension should not exceed a manual effort of 25 pounds when the ladder is raised to the locked position. Once the spring tension is properly set, raise the ladder until the lock pin on the latch assembly engages the V-block on the ladder rail. If the pin on the ladder does not engage the latch assembly, loosen the four bolts holding the assembly in place and slide the assembly in the slotted holes provided until the pin will engage. Retighten the four bolts. Then apply approximately 50 pounds of force on the rearmost step. If the ladder remains locked, you are ready to proceed to the next step. If the ladder unlocks, readjust the latch assembly until the ladder remains locked. The final step is to install the amber warning light that fits on the side of the platform extension. Place the mounting bracket over the holes provided on the side of the platform and attach using two 5 16 inch by 3 quarter inch carriage bolts. Tighten the nuts securely. Then remove the knockout adjacent to the bracket and insert the rubber grommet into the hole provided. Attach the amber light to the bracket. The wire found in the battery compartment can now be threaded along the channel under the extension floor as shown. Complete the installation by plugging the electrical wire into the terminal harness. The second amber light that goes on the combine should also be installed at this time. A hole is provided near the front of the grain tank on the right hand side for this purpose. We're now ready to prepare the head for mounting on the combine. This task can be accomplished quickly and easily by following these steps. First, it will be necessary to remove the divider assembly attached beneath the head on the shipping frame. Don't attempt to tip the head until this has been removed. Next, install the head filler plates that are provided using the carriage head bolts located in the sundries box. The next step will vary depending on whether you're working on a corn head or a grain head. If it's a grain head, bolt a pair of angle irons like those shown here to the guard bolts. If it's a corn head, attach the angle irons to the frame as shown on the decal and inspect the vine knife settings before proceeding to the next step. Proceed by raising the forks on your lift until they are above the head and attaching a chain to the forks and to the angle irons which you just installed. Make sure the chain is at approximately a 45 degree angle from level. When the chain is in place, you are ready to begin lowering the head to a horizontal position. Slowly back the forklift up until the head starts to tip. Do not lower the forks or lift the header off the ground as either can cause damage. Once the head has tipped over the balance point, continue to slowly back the forklift and begin to lower the forks at the same time. Try to keep the chain at a 45 degree angle at all times. Continue this process until the head is all the way down. This completes the unloading process and the combine is now ready to be moved into the shop. ready to make a thorough inspection of the combine's various internal systems. Let's begin by discussing the chain and slat type elevator first, then cover the paddle elevator. We'll proceed step by step through the process of inspecting and adjusting both of these vital mechanisms. The first step in inspecting a chain and slat elevator is to check the tension of the chains. To measure the tension on a grain combine, Use a spring and scale to apply 40 pounds of force upward from a point in line with the front edge of the first access door from the front. If it's a rice combine, you'll need to apply 50 pounds of force upward from the same position due to the longer elevator chain. While the force is being applied, 
measure the amount of deflection that occurs at the free sag position. Proper deflection is 1 and 3 eighths inches to 1 and 5 eighths inches. If the deflection does not fall within these guidelines, adjustment is necessary. This is accomplished by turning the nuts on the eye bolts found on both sides of the elevator. Always make sure that the tension is the same on both sides of the elevator so that the drum remains square with the sides of the elevator housing. When the chain tension is correct, check the clearance between one of the slats and the bottom of the elevator housing directly below the front drum. To do this, place the adjustment lever in the lowest hole in the quadrant and measure the clearance. 3 16 inch is the minimum allowable clearance. If the clearance measures more or less than this amount, Adjust it to 3 16 inch by varying the number of washers between the block and the spacer. Once this adjustment has been made, place the adjusting lever in the second notch from the bottom. Now, let's take a look at how to properly inspect and adjust a paddle elevator. On grain machines having two rubber blades on each paddle, the critical factor is the timing of the paddles. The lower four paddles must operate at 90 degree to each other, or material will not feed properly. If the paddles are not operating at 90 degrees to each other, they must be adjusted to the correct position using the drive chain on the left side of the elevator. When the paddle positions are correct, move on to the slip clutch located on the left-hand side of the second shaft from the top of the elevator. Correctly adjust it by tightening the bolts on the clutch until the springs at the rear bottom out. Then back the bolts off a half turn and lock the lock nuts. The last step necessary in making sure a paddle elevator is in proper working order is to inspect the tension of the right and left hand table drive chains. This is done on the right hand side by measuring the length of the spring on the inlet sprocket. The correct measurement is six inches. If necessary, adjust it to that length by tightening or loosening the nuts on the rod that holds the spring in place. If the tension on the drive chain on the left-hand side of the elevator is incorrect, adjust it by moving the right and left idler sprockets until the tension is correct. This concludes the inspection and adjustment of the elevator, and you're ready to move on to other internal components. Now is the time to make sure the stone trap door opens and closes properly and that the trap is seed tight. Adjust the webbing around the door if necessary. Next, you'll want to check the torque of the cylinder rasp bars or spike tooth bar. Correct torque is 80 to 85 foot-pounds for a rasp bar cylinder, 35 to 40 foot-pounds for a spike tooth cylinder. If it's a rasp bar, You'll also want to make sure the bars are in the proper right-left order, so they always oppose each other. If you're setting up an MF-550, 750, or 760, check the front and rear concave indexing using the following steps. First, on a rasp bar cylinder, check the front clearance by moving the adjustment lever to the open position, then back to number five. If it's a spike tooth bar, move the lever to the open position, then back to number one. Second, measure the front clearance. Correct figures are 5 16 inch for a rasp bar, 3 8 inch for a spike tooth. Third, if necessary, adjust the clearance, the concave control linkage turnbuckle. Fourth, Check to see that the clearances are the same to within 1 32nd inch on the right and left hand sides. If clearances are not equal on both sides, remove the bolt from the eccentric bushing on the right hand side of the concave and rotate the eccentric until the front clearance is the same on both sides. Place the index bolt into the hole that aligns with the hole in the eccentric. Fifth. Now, open the rear access door and measure the rear clearance. The proper space is 1 8 inch if a rasp bar and a quarter inch if a spike tooth. Sixth, 
Finally, recheck the stone trap door to ensure that it is still seed tight. Now, let's take a look at the rear beater and the threshing grate. The first step is to make sure the blades are tight on the rear beater. You'll want to give extra attention to the second step, since it can easily be overlooked. If you're setting up an MF750 or 760 combine that's to be used in corn, make sure you move the reinforcing bar on the threshing grate back four inches from the end of the fingers. This seems like a small job, but it's also a very important one. Now we're ready to check the tension of the rear beater to table elevator chain. This chain should show a maximum deflection of one quarter inch to three quarters inch when 10 pounds of force is applied midway between the sprockets. If necessary, adjust the chain's tension at the idler sprocket until it meets these requirements. The remaining steps to adjusting and inspecting the combine's internal components include checking the bolts on the straw walker bearings and walker pan to make sure they're tight. Making sure the curtain on the front of the grain pan is seed tight moving the sieve adjustment levers back and forth to see that they work properly and that the sieves open evenly and fit tight. Check the tension of the clean grain and return elevator chains. If they don't fit snugly on the lower sprocket, loosen the bearing plate nuts at the top and increase their tension. And finally, checking the rotor of the return cylinder to see that it is properly installed and that the rasp bars are in the proper right-left arrangement. If the combine is to be used in corn, remove all of the channel section from the inside of the hinged cover and place them in the storage position outside the door. This concludes all of the inspection required on the internal components of the combine. A number of belts on the combine whose condition and tension must be checked before the combine is delivered to the customer. The following instructions on proper belt tensioning have been developed to make this job as fast and simple as possible. Let's take a look. The first thing to do is inspect the tension of the main drive belt. Begin by placing the control lever in the drive engaged position. Then, if you're working on the MF750 or 760, measure the overall length of the adjusting spring. Correct lengths are 5 and 5 eighths inches for the MF750, 6 and 7 sixteenths inches for the MF760. If necessary, adjust the spring's length with the nuts on the left end of the spring. On the MF760, also check the length of the rod holding the spring. Instructions for further adjustments of the rod are available in the MF Combine Setup Manual. The MF750 has a special nut at this location, and no adjustment is necessary. Once these two lengths are correct, the main drive belt will be properly tensioned. If you're setting up an MF550 Combine, now is the proper time to inspect the separator pulley clutch and linkage settings. Begin by measuring the force required to lock the clutch lever or center. It should fall in the 60 to 75 pound range. If it doesn't, adjust the notched ring in the center of the clutch assembly as follows. Depress the spring-loaded pin holding the ring in place and rotate the ring clockwise to increase the force, counterclockwise to decrease the force. When finished, again check the force required to lock the clutch lever over center. If it is still not correct, continue adjusting the ring until the correct force is acquired. The next step is to engage the clutch and lock the control lever over center. This should occur just before the lever reaches the lower end of the slot. If it doesn't, adjust the clevis found on the throwout arm to obtain the correct amount of travel. That takes care of the separator pulley clutch adjustment on the MF550. We're now ready to resume our discussion on belt tensioning. Our next stop is at the grain tank unloading belts. 
The MF540 and 750 unloading belts are spring-loaded and require no adjustment. When the grain tank unloading belt is properly tensioned, prepare to check the tension of the counter shaft belt. When inspecting an MF550, 750, or 760, measure the length of the rod on the idler pulley. Adjust the length using the turnbuckle located in the center of the rod. The distance between the inside loops on each end of the rod should be 8 and 15 sixteenths inches on an MF550 and 18 inches on an MF750 or 760. On an F540, begin by checking the tension of both fan drive belts by using your thumb to apply approximately 25 pounds of pressure midway between the longer span of both belts. If the deflection measures greater or less than one half inch, adjust the belt tensions at the idler pulley on the right-hand side of the combine. This takes care of the counter shaft and fan drive belts, and we're now ready to inspect a clean grain auger and shoe drive belt. This procedure is the same on all models. Using your thumb, apply approximately 25 pounds of force midway between the pulleys on the longest strand. If the deflection is more or less than one half inch, adjust the belt by loosening the center bolt on the tightener pulley, adjusting the tension until the correct amount of deflection is obtained, and retightening the center bolt. The straw walker drive belt and returns cylinder drive belt are checked in exactly the same manner as we just described for the three previous belts. Apply approximately 25 pounds of force with your thumb midway between the pulleys of the longest strand. If the deflection measures more or less than a half inch, adjust the tension on the straw walker drive belt with the idler adjusting arm. The tension of the returns cylinder drive belt is adjusted at tightener pulley. We have now made all of the inspections and adjustments necessary to the belts on the combine. Cylinder and fan speed settings are critical to proper combine performance. So you want to make sure these components are set precisely. To check and adjust the cylinder's low and high speed settings on the MF550, 750, and 760, place the transmission in neutral, start the combine's engine, and engage the drives. Now, set the cylinder speed on extreme slow and let the combine run for approximately 30 seconds. On the MF750 and 760, check the lugs on the cylinder housing to see if they make contact with the low speed nuts and that the distance between sheaves number five and six is approximately three and one sixteenth inches. If this measurement is incorrect, or the lugs on the MF 750 and 760 are not making contact, adjust the cylinder speed setting with a stop bolt provided for that purpose, as we're doing here. Continue to check these settings and adjust if necessary. To ensure the proper fast settings for the cylinder and fan on an MF-550, 750, or 760, move the cylinder and fan speed controls to extreme fast. Run the combine for a few seconds. Then shut the engine off and again check the setting of the limit stops. This time, the lugs should make contact with high-speed nuts, and there should be a minimum 30,000 inches of clearance between the hub facings on the pulley sheaves. Since a hacksaw blade is approximately 30,000 inches thick, this provides an easy way to measure this setting. To adjust the high-speed setting of the fan on an MF750 or 760, restart the combine and put a tachometer on the fan. The correct speed should be approximately 1,100 RPM. If it isn't, adjust the limit stop to this setting. Taking the time to make sure a combine goes out with the correct cylinder and fan speed settings can save service personnel a trip to the field at a later date. Sluggish hydraulic response is another problem can make a customer unhappy in a hurry. 
So let's take a look now at how to test the hydraulic pressure in the various systems and how to correct any problems you might find. The first system we'll check is the hydrostatic traction drive. It's important that this procedure be done according to the steps we're now going to show you. Begin by plugging a pressure gauge into the top port on the motor manifold as we're doing here. When the gauge is in place, start the combine engine. Put the transmission in high gear and apply the brakes. Hold the combine with the brakes while slowly applying power until the relief valve blows. The pressure gauge should show a minimum reading of 5,500 PSI. If it doesn't, adjust the relief valve located under the foot pedal with shims and continue testing until the proper pressure is achieved. If the combine is equipped with electrohydraulic header height control, place the pressure gauge in the T that's been placed in the hydraulic line for this purpose. Start the combine and raise the header as high as it will go. Continue to push the raise switch until the relief valve on the header height control blows. The pressure gauge should register at least 2,250 pounds. If it doesn't, Adjust the relief valve with shims until the pressure is correct. On combines having regular transmissions, the Cessna control valve provides pressure to the variable speed traction drive, the reel lift, and the unloading auger, allowing us to check all three of these systems at one time. Using the quick coupler on the pressure gauge, insert the gauge into the quick coupler on the reel lift. Then, increase the hydraulic load until the relief valve blows. Check the gauge reading as before. If it doesn't register at least 1,900 pounds, adjust the relief valve with shims until this reading is obtained. Continue by attaching the pressure gauge to the power steering cylinder, starting the combine again, and blowing the relief valve by turning the wheels to the extreme right or left. The correct reading for the power steering system is 1,750 to 1,850 pounds. As in the other systems, adjust with shims if necessary. This concludes our pressure checks, but you still need to look for leaks, seeps, and weeps around all hydraulic fittings. Also, if you notice that any of the hydraulic control levers fail to return to neutral, inspect and adjust their linkage accordingly. Once the hydraulic systems are in good order, you're ready to move on to the wheels and tires. It's important to adjust the combine's rear axle width to the customer's needs when possible. This can be accomplished in three easy steps. First, remove the bolts and brackets on the axle holding the hydraulic cylinders and adjust the axle sections that slide over the fixed section to the required width. Second, remove the rod bolts and adjust the length of the rod to match the new rear axle width. Third, tighten the rod bolts and torque the cylinder bolts to 340 to 520 foot-pounds. Now that the axle width is correct, it's time to make sure that the rear wheels tow in properly. The wheels pointed straight ahead. Use a tape to measure the distance between the inner sides of the tires at hub height. Measure from the back of the tires first and note the distance. Now measure the same distance at the front of the tires. This measurement should be 3 8 inches to a half inches less than the rear measurement. If it isn't, Adjust the toe-in by lengthening or shortening the tie rod until the correct dimension is obtained. Equal travel of the rear wheels is also essential to proper combine handling. So let's take a look at how to check and adjust these settings. Start the combine's engine and turn the wheels to full left. In this position, the left lug should contact the left axle stop. Next, Turn the wheels to full right and check to see if the right lug contacts the right axle stop. If either cylinder is out of adjustment, the lugs may contact on one side 
not the other. When this occurs, adjust the cylinders by disconnecting the ball joint on the cylinder on the side not making contact, and turning the wheels so the lug not making contact touches the stop. If turning the wheels will not bring the lug into contact, it will be necessary to disconnect the other cylinder and set the wheels against the stop. Release the lock nut on the cylinders and turn the ball joint until it aligns with the hole in the bracket. Once aligned, continue to turn the ball joint four full turns to provide approximately a quarter inch of clearance inside the cylinder. Align the ball joint with the bracket by turning the steering wheel to move the piston inside the cylinder. Then reconnect the ball joint and tighten the lock nut. Check your adjustments by again turning the wheels full left and full right to see if the lugs now make contact with the stops as they should. If they don't, continue to adjust and check the wheels. When the wheels are set so that their travel is equal, refer to the operator's manual for correct tire pressures and measure tire pressure and set accordingly. Proper adjustment of a combine equipped with tracks can be found in the MF Combine Setup Manual. This concludes the checks and adjustments necessary on the combine itself. And we're now ready to move on to the assembly, setup, and attachment of various accessories. If the combine is an MF750 or MF760 that's going to be used in corn, a corn kit will have to be installed. This requires that an additional header lift cylinder or cylinders be added according to the size of the head. For example, the MF1153, 1154, and 1163 heads require that one additional cylinder be installed in the center of the elevator in the brackets provided. The MF1164 and 1183 require that two additional cylinders be installed in the brackets provided. Once the cylinders are in place, install the threshing cylinder filler bars. Bolt each of the eight bars provided between the rasp bars on the cylinder spiders. Secure with one-half inch by one inch bolts, flat washers, and lock washers using the holes in the spiders. Continue the corn kit installation by removing the vein type bars on the rear beater drum and attaching the rear beater spikes in their place. Each set of three bars must be installed in alternate order on the drum with the spikes trailing in the direction of the drum rotation. Continue the installation process by removing the top one and an eighth inch sieve in the triple sieve shoe and replacing it with the one and five eighths inch chaffer sieve provided with the corn kit. Attach the chaffer sieve with the hardware removed from the smaller sieve. Complete the installation of the corn kit by attaching the risers on the straw walkers. These are to be attached with the screws and clips provided in the holes toward the rear of the walkers. If the combine you're working on does not require a corn kit, the next accessories which should be installed are the mirrors. This process consists of simply attaching the left mirror to the light bracket supplied and replacing the shipping bracket with this new assembly. Attach the right mirror to the mounting bracket provided on the right-hand side of the combine. If the combine is equipped with a straw chopper or straw spreader kit, you should install these accessories at this time. To install the straw chopper, remove all loose parts from inside the chopper and proceed as follows. Put the slide rails into place as shown here and attach the triangular brackets provided at the rear of the slide rails. Then install the metal divider in the holes provided. Remove the limit bolts from the rear of the slide rails and slide the chopper onto the rails. Push the chopper as far forward as it will go. Next, route the straw chopper rear belt in the pulleys provided and over the chopper drive pulley. Now, install the governor mechanism on the left end of the rotor shaft and install the warning mechanism as shown. 
Make sure the wires have sufficient length to allow the customer to slide the chopper backward in case he decides to bale the straw. You'll also find the installation of the straw spreader kit to be equally simple. However, special care must be taken to ensure that the paddle assemblies are correctly installed. The paddles must be attached to the drive shafts so that when rotated, a paddle on one assembly is always between two paddles on the opposite assembly. With that in mind, secure each paddle assembly to the drive shaft using a 5 16 inch by 2 and a quarter inch hex bolt. If the assemblies do not conform to the correct pattern once you've attached them, remove one of the assemblies from the drive shaft and rotate it 180 degrees. Reattach the assembly and it should now be in the correct pattern. An extremely important accessory on many MF750-760 combines is the 14-channel electronic monitor and tachometer. And while these units are factory installed, you do need to inspect them carefully to make sure that all systems are working properly. The instructions that follow will show and explain how to properly do this. However, if the lights, tones, or readouts do not function as described here, refer to your MF Combine Setup Manual for instructions on how to troubleshoot both units. The first step in checking out the electronic monitor is to install a jumper wire between the terminals on the engine oil pressure switch. A cotter pin makes an excellent jumper device for this test. Now, turn the ignition key to the on position, but do not start the engine. You're now ready to go through the checklist that follows. First, note the fuel gauge. Does it activate? If not, inspect the jumper wire on the terminals. Second, engage the separator lever. The returns elevator speed, straw chopper speed, cylinder speed, fanning mill speed, grain elevator speed, and straw walker speed lights and warning tone should activate. The oil light should also indicate a lack of oil pressure. Third, pull the parking brake into the position. Both the light and tone on the monitor should activate. Fourth, open the stone trap door and check whether the light and tone activate. When you've completed your checks of these systems, attach a ground wire to the hydraulic oil temperature and engine coolant temperature switches on the combine. Once connected, the appropriate lights should come on and the warning tone should sound. Next, lift the walker overload plate and note if the light and tone activate. Engage the unloading auger. Both the monitor light and tone should activate. With the engine running, completely cover the air cleaner intake pipe with a block of wood. This should provide sufficient restriction to cause the light and tone on the monitor to activate. And finally, run the tachometer back and forth through all four readouts to see that it is working and that the readings are reliable. The final accessory to be installed on the combine is the head. The initial steps in this process are the same for a grain or corn head. Later in our instructions, we'll explain the procedures that apply specifically to a corn head and to a grain head. Begin by checking to see that the locking cam is in the unlocked position, that the coupling sleeve is in place on the elevator, and that the lower latch is in the transport position. Now, slowly drive the combine toward the rear of the head, with the elevator pins lower than the table hooks on the head. When the pins are positioned under the head, slowly raise the head so the pins and hooks engage. Continue to raise the head until it is clear of the ground. Then, lower the head until it touches the ground, and the elevator pins are clear of the hooks. Now, slowly raise the elevator until the pins just make contact with the hooks. If the head is level, both pins will make contact at the same time. If one pin makes contact before the other, the hook not making contact must be adjusted in order to make the head level. 
lower the elevator and loosen the bolts holding the hook. Raise or lower the hook in the serrated facings to a point where you believe the pins will contact at the same time and retighten the bolts on the hook. Check your positioning of the hook by again raising the elevator to see if the pins make contact at the same time. If they do not, continue to adjust the hook until simultaneous contact is made. The head is now ready to be locked into position. To do this, move the locking cam on the left side of the elevator into the locked position shown here. Then remove the pin in the lower latch and move the locking lever to engage the latch into the fixed pin under the table. Push the lever back far enough so that it locks over center. Then insert the pin you just removed into the hole provided to secure the latch in the locked position. If the lower latch moves too easily or requires too much effort, release the latch and adjust it by turning the nut on the latch bolt shown here. Repeat the same procedure on the right-hand side of the combine. Then connect the quick connect coupling for the real lift hydraulics and attach the electrical connectors for the automatic header height control, if so equipped. When the head has been leveled and locked, we can then align the drive shaft if necessary. To check the alignment, you'll need two small pieces of metal like those we're using here. The metal pieces must have at least one straight edge. Place the metal pieces on the coupling halves in the position shown and cite the horizontal and vertical alignment. If the horizontal alignment is incorrect, insert shims between the shaft mounting bracket and the back of the table. If vertical alignment requires adjustment, loosen the nuts on the bolts holding the shaft mounting bracket in place and move the nuts on the vertical rod attached to the mounting bracket up or down until the alignment is correct. Complete the process by sliding the coupling sleeve on the drive shaft over the half coupling, inserting the lock pin, and placing the safety shield over the shaft coupling. Never send a combine out to a customer until these procedures have been successfully accomplished. An unlevel head or improper drive shaft alignment can lead to poor combine performance and undue wear. From this point on, the procedures you follow will vary depending on whether you're mounting a grain head or a corn head. We'll continue our instructions using a grain head, then come back to this same point later in the program and show you how to complete the job if you're attaching a corn head. If the grain head is equipped with very speed real drive, you need to install the electric control for this unit next. The first step in doing this is to insert the wires on the control button into the opening in the end of the real height control lever. Continue pushing the wires into the opening and finally insert the control button into the opening. When the button is in place, reach under the console and connect the leads to the wiring harness. Then plug the wires into the socket under the operator's platform and bolt the wires to the vertical elevator with the clips provided. Leave sufficient slack to allow the elevator to be raised or lowered. If the combine is equipped with hydrostatic real drive, only one step is necessary in the installation process. Simply connect the hydraulic hoses at the elevator and at the head. That's all there is to it. Finish the process by installing the outer dividers and reel drums as shown in the combine setup and pre-delivery manual. If the combine is not equipped with very speed reel drive or hydrostatic reel drive, your next step in setting up the grain head will be to inspect the sickle. Raise the header and lock the safety stop. Then measure the clearance between the guide located under clip and the back of the knife. If the clearance is less than or greater than ten thousandth of an inch, adjust the clearance by loosening the bolts holding the clip and sliding the knife guide forward or backward until the clearance measures ten thousandths of an inch. Retighten the bolts and measure the clearance between the clip and the knife sections. 
If the clearance measures between three thousandths of an inch and eight thousandths of an inch, no adjustment is necessary. If the measurement does not fall within these parameters, bend the clip up or down until the measurement is correct. When the sickle is ready to go, move on to the knife drive. Locate and remove the oil breather that's wired to the head where the divider fastens. Let's take another look at its location so you won't waste a lot of valuable time hunting for it. It's on the head, the point where the divider attaches. When you've located it, remove the pipe plug on the drive and replace it with the breather by screwing it into the opening. When the breather is in place, put a wrench on the oil drain plug to make sure it fits tight. Continue your setup of the grain head by inspecting the horizontal and vertical alignment of the table auger. This can be done by checking how well the auger fits into the concave at the bottom of the table. If the combine is going to be running in small grain, the auger should be approximately finger height off the bottom of the table. If it's a rice combine, it should just clear the table bottom. If you need to correct the horizontal or vertical alignment, loosen the four nuts on the auger end plate on the left-hand side of the table. Then loosen the same nuts on the right-hand side, plus the lever locking nut. If you're making a horizontal adjustment, reposition the auger and the slots in the end of the table until the alignment is correct. If a vertical adjustment is necessary, raise or lower the auger by turning the nuts on the height adjusting bolt attached to the securing plate at the side of the head. The auger will swing back when the bolts are loose, so the bolts must be tightened as these adjustments are made. In either instance, always complete the following three steps when adjusting an auger. First, check to see that the clearance between the auger and the table is the same at both ends. If necessary, adjust until the clearance is equal. Second, check to be sure that the clearance between the retractable fingers and the table bottom is in the quarter inch to three-eighths inch range. If it isn't, adjust the clearance using the adjustment levers at the right end of the table. Third, make sure the cutoff bar just clears the auger flighting. If necessary, loosen the attaching bolts and slide the bar in or out. Move the auger drive vane and check the tension. Total deflection should be approximately a half inch on the longest span. If it isn't, adjust the adjusting bolt on the idler. That completes our inspection and adjustment of the auger. Our next job is to center the reel in the table. The procedure you follow is going to vary according to the type of reel you're adjusting. If you're working with a U2 reel, simply loosen the nuts holding the reel in place. Slide the reel in the slots in the block and retighten the nuts. It's very important that the reel be properly centered. So if you don't get it right the first time, keep adjusting. Also important to reel performance is the tension of the reel drive belt or chain. To check their tension, measure the length of the tension spring between its loop ends. If it isn't approximately 19 and 3 quarter inches, relocate the belt or chain in its retainer until the spring measures 19 and 3 quarter inches. If the table is equipped with a floating cutter bar, you'll need to take some special precautions to see that it is working properly. We'll now take you step by step through this procedure to help eliminate any confusion. First, raise the head until the bar arms are clear of the ground when you've done this, adjust the spring tension bracket on the extreme left-hand cutter bar arm until the bracket is four inches from its rearmost position. Next, adjust the spring tension brackets on the remaining cutter bar arm until the chains at the front of the header start to slacken. It is important at this point to make sure the chains are not slack, but have only begun show signs of loosening their tension. When these chains are properly adjusted, Measure the length of the counterbalance spring between the inside of its loop ends. When the header is raised, the spring should measure approximately 16 and a half inches. If the floating cutter bar is correctly adjusted, it can be easily raised by hand, but then drops to tighten the limit chains when released. 
If necessary, adjust the length of the spring using the nuts on the adjusting bolt. Adjustment can also be made using the spring clamps underneath. When this has been done, lower the header and move the switch on the operator's console to activate the automatic header height control. Leave the engine running and check the operation of the header by moving the control on the right-hand side of the combine and noting the response. Lock the adjusting bolt with the header approximately one inch above the ground. This completes our attachment and setup of a grain head. If you're attaching and setting up a corn head, proceed to the following four steps after aligning the drive shaft. First, check the tension of the gathering chains by measuring the length of the tension spring. If the spring doesn't measure approximately two and three quarter inches, adjust it to that length using the nuts on the attaching rod. Second, measure the width between the points on the stock rolls. Normally, they are set to three and three eighths inches at the factory. If they're not, set them to this using the adjusting nut on the left hand roll. Third, check the settings on the snapping plates. The front gap should measure 1 5 16 inches. The rear gap, 1 and a half inches. If necessary, adjust at the bolt on the left-hand snapping plate. And fourth, attach the front points using the bolts, washers, and nuts provided. The corn head is now in place and ready for use. The final inspection that's required is to check the rear beater speed. Begin by starting the combine's engine and running the machine for five to 10 minutes. Then shut off the engine and inspect the belts and chains to make sure they're operating properly. If everything checks out, restart the engine and the combine and let them run at full throttle for two hours. At the end of this time, place a tachometer on the rear beater and check the speed. If the combine is an MF750 or 760 equipped with a digital tachometer, use it to check the speed. The correct beater speeds will vary according to the model and serial number. So refer to your combine setup and pre-delivery manual for the correct settings. There you have it. A complete, easy-to-use program that takes you all the way through the setup and pre-delivery of an MF540, MF550, MF750, or MF760 combine. Use this entire tape as often as necessary to familiarize yourself with each step in the process. Or use its random access capability to select specific areas when you need to brush up on certain procedures. Both are real time servers.